The National Inventory of Dams is a database that the Corps of Engineers maintains to track and to keep characteristics on the dams throughout the United States. Did you know that there's over 90,000 dams in the United States? And most of these dams are privately owned, as you can tell from the green dots that are on this map. In fact, there's so many green dots that it's hard to even see that the dots. In addition to private ownership, we also have federal, local government, public utility, state, and tribal government ownership of dams. So with so many dams throughout the United States and even throughout the world, it's likely that you've encountered dams and you may be wondering, how does water get from one side of the dam to the other? So I put together this video to show different methods for moving water through dams. One thing I would appreciate is that if you know a method that I've left out of this video, if you put that in the comments along with the name of the dam that uses that method, I would appreciate it. The first method for moving water through a dam is sending it through a hydropower plant. When we send water through a hydropower plant, we're moving it from the upstream side of the dam, sending it through the hydropower turbines, and then releasing it downstream of the dam. There are two variables which affect how much power can be generated. Obviously, the first one is going to be how much flow we send through the turbine. The next one is going to be the difference between the water level upstream of the dam and the water level downstream of the dam. So upstream of the dam is called headwater, downstream of the dam is called tailwater, and the difference between those two is called the head differential. When sizing a power plant, that determination is made by how much flow is available and how much head differential is available. So we can have a relatively small power plant like this one on the Arkansas River, which has a capacity of about 45 megawatts, or we could have very large power plants like Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River, which has about 150 times the capacity of this one on the Arkansas River at 6,800 megawatts. The next method for releasing water through a dam is through the use of conduits. And here you can see that we have water being taken in by this intake structure being sent through a conduit that goes through the dam uh, and then into the tailwater. Now, these conduits can go through the dam. They can also go through the abutments that are on the side of the dam. If we look at this intake structure and profile view, we can see that this intake tower does extend out into the reservoir. And if we were able to look below the surface of the water, we would see that this intake tower does go below the water surface. And in order to get water into the tower and ultimately into the conduits, we just have gate, a gate or gates that are used for that purpose. Now, some of these releases can be quite traumatic, as you'll see in the video that was produced by the Bureau of Reclamation showing releases at Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado River. In this next video, we're going to see flow going through a controlled spillway. And when I use the word controlled, it just means that the spillway has gates on it. And in this case, the gates are going to be a tainter gate. When we open up a tainter gate, the flow is going to be going underneath that gate. The gates are designed such that when they're in the closed position, the bottom of the gate will sit on the spillway crest. As the water level in the reservoir rises, it can become necessary to open the tanner gates. And as you can see, as we open the tanner gates, we do get a higher top of gate elevation. We also are getting release that's occurring underneath the bottom of the spillway gate. We can look at a dam that has two spillways on it, and that dam is Canton Dam. Canton Dam is located in the state of Oklahoma. 
And typically when you have a dam that has two spillways on it, it's because it's been determined that the main spillway is not capable of passing a very large flood. And that flood is typically going to be the probable maximum flood. So if we move over to where we can see these two spillways, the first spillway is going to be the main spillway. And that's made up of those tainer gates that we had looked at before. The auxiliary spillway is made up of what's called fuse gates, and they form this labyrinth type arrangement. We can take a closer look at this spillway. Here we're looking at the downstream face of the spillway. We get a better perspective if we look from above. And in this picture, you can see that the water is low, but you can envision this water rising to the top of this spillway. And if it was to do so, then you would expect water to flow over the front of the spillway, but also to flow over the side, flow over the back. Basically, you would expect water to flow over the entire spillway crest. So why is that hydraulically important? To help answer that question, it's best to look at the spillway in plan view. First, you want to understand that there is a relationship between weir length and the flow over the weir. Basically, as wear length increases, the flow over the weir is going to increase. So if we didn't have this labyrinth type spillway, the greatest wear length that we could have would be the width of the opening. However, you can see that in this labyrinth arrangement for the same opening, we are increasing the wear length, which is also going to help us increase the flow over the weir. Straddling the Nevada-Arizona border just outside of the city of Las Vegas is a very well-known dam, and it's Hoover Dam. And we're going to navigate over to Hoover Dam to take a look at a different type or another type of spillway gate. So Hoover Dam has these spillways on both the Arizona and on the Nevada side. And these spillway gates are composed of four steel drum gates. The operation of a drum gate is relatively straightforward. In this schematic, you can see that the reservoir is on the left-hand side, and we open up this valve, which is going to allow us to fill this chamber. When that chamber becomes full, it causes this drum gate to rise. We do close our downstream valve in order to keep that chamber filled. Now, you may notice that the difference between the drum gate that you're learning about now and the tainer gate that you learned about earlier is that when we close a drum gate, it's actually in the raised position as opposed to a tainer gate, which is going to be in the lowered position. Another difference is that when we release water through a tainer gate, that release is going underneath the tainer gate. But when we release water through a drum gate, the release is going to be over the top of the drum gate. So if we want to open up a drum gate, we'll close that upstream valve, open up the downstream valve, and then some of the water in the chamber will then be evacuated, which is going to cause the drum gate to start to fall. If we want to continue to have the drum gate fall and have release go over the top of it, we can just keep the same configuration. And now you can see that the drum gate has fallen even further, and now we're starting to get flow over the top of the drum gate. This is a video of the Warragamba Spillway in Australia. This is a video that was put out by Water NSW or Water New South Wales. And what's really interesting about this video is that it, uh, it shows two different types of spillway gates that we've been discussing. You can see in the center that there's a open drum gate. We know that it's open because we have water that's going over the top of it. And then on each side of the drum gate, we have two tanner gates. And the tanner gates that are immediately adjacent to the drum gate are open, and we can see that we have flow going underneath those tanner gates. This is a video that was taken by the Bureau of Reclamation, and what it's showing is a morning glory spillway. These morning glory spillways are ideal for areas where you may not have the space to put in a traditional spillway. As we learned earlier from the labyrinth weir, the flow going over a weir is going to be related to the length of the weir. In the case of the morning glory spillway, the length of the weir is going to be the circumference of the circle. 
and we can see that we have flow going over this entire circumference. For our final method of how dams release water, we're going to look at Wyvenhoe Dam on the Brisbane River, which is located upstream of the city of Brisbane. Wyvenhoe Dam does have a traditional spillway with Tanner Gates. However, the structure that I'm interested in looking at is not at the main spillway. However, it's going to be these fuse plugs. Now these fuse plugs are made of earthen material, so they are erodible. You can see that the reservoir, you see the reservoir upstream of these fuse plugs. And what these fuse plugs are designed to do is to hold on to water in the reservoir to allow Wyvernhoe Dam to store more water. However, when the reservoir gets to be too high, the water will overflow these fuse plugs and it'll wash them out, and then this will become an uncontrolled spillway. And it needs to become an uncontrolled spillway to provide protection for the dam. This is a very simple schematic of a fuse plug, and here you can see that the reservoir has uh, risen to the point where it's up against the upstream face of this fuse plug, and if it continues to rise, it'll begin to overflow the fuse plug and start to wash away some of that material, causing a release to occur over the top of the fuse plug until eventually the entire fuse plug is washed away, creating an uncontrolled spillway. If you found the video to be informative, please subscribe to the channel and or like the video, and I do appreciate you watching this one.